Yeah, voice got stronger all of a sudden, didn't it? John chapter 16 is where we're going to be back. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit uh, and who he is and what he does and how he functions within the church. This discussion began in 1 Thessalonians where Paul says that we preach the gospel with power. And we talked about that power, that deutimous power. Same word today, we get the word dynamite. Okay? And so we began to say, why is it that churches today seem to be so anemic? Uh, and there seems to be little power. Uh, and I think that it is because we really do misunderstand the role uh, of the Holy Spirit. Now, we've gotten down about, I think, about verse 13, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe not. You know, the verse 9, I think he says where he's going to convict the world or convince the world of sin in that verse 9. And then verse 10 says of righteousness, and I think we covered that, okay? And then of judgment, and I asked you a question. I said, is the judgment that he speaks of future or present? What judgment is he talking about, okay? We talked a little bit about the Holocaust we talked a little bit about the destruction of the temple and how that judgment had fallen on the Jews. You remember at, at Pilate's court, they said, let, let his blood be upon us and our children forever. Uh, so I think they are somewhat uh, experiencing the judgment of God because they have rejected the Prince of Peace. That's why there's no peace in the Middle East because the one that could bring peace is the very one that they've rejected, okay? So that has been said. From the Christian's perspective, there is a judgment future, okay? Uh, not a judgment so much of today, but a judgment future. And there are going to be two of them, okay? And the, one, the first one, it, well, not the first one. One of them is the great white throne judgment. Maybe you've heard this referred to. Some people say it's the judgment of God. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It is the judgment of the lost, those that have rejected Christ, those who have not received him, whatever the reason might be. It says this, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 13. So I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from those whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to his works. Now, the reason that we know that this is the judgment of the lost and not save people here is why? Because they came from death and hell. Okay, because they came from death, they came from hell. All right, what else? It, the, key, the, key, the key that you need to look at right here, especially if you follow along in your Bible, the books were opened, those which were written in the books according to their, okay, down here. They were judged every man according to their, that's how you know that it was lost, folks. Because we will not be judged according to our works. We're judged based on grace. Okay? Which means that, guess what? Our works are only judged as to whether or not they'll be saved or lost. The works. You know what I'm saying? Wood, hay, and stubble versus gold. You know what I'm saying? Some of the works we do are wood, hay, and stubble, and they will be what? Tried as by fire and burn up. Okay? Here they're tried by their works. Yes, Miss Barbara. No. That's a different book. Because what you're going to find out later on is you're going to find out that, there are, that, that everybody's name is written in the book of life. 
everybody. Everybody that draws a breath, their name. But in the other book, the Lamb's book of life, their names are blotted out. And the reason they're blotted out is because they rejected him. They said they were going to do it on. And see, and, and the reason that this works thing is important is because why would they be judged by their works? And we're judged by our grace, by, gra by God's grace. Because they've refused it, right? So what basis do they have to stand before God to say, let me in? <coughs> Only their works. It's going to fall short, absolutely. But that's the only thing they got to go by. You know, I know you've heard the people say, well, you know, uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, I, I hope my good outweighs my bad. I'm a good person. I pay some of my taxes, and I don't kick the dog very often. I'm good. Well, the problem is, is that guess what? What's the best you can do? Isaiah said the best you can do is filthy rags. That is the very best that you can do. And he said, works can't save you. Yes, Miss Barbara. Well, I never got to 13, but calm down in verse 15, it says, and he shows the what's not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. So I'm, I don't understand why that, we got that up before that. that because what, the, what he's saying is, if your name's not in there, right? If your name's not in there, what was their punishment? What was the judgment? They were judged according to what? Their works. Remember I told you this book right here has everybody's name that's ever drawn breath in it in there? And when they, when they came to that, guess what? They didn't, there, there was, their works couldn't earn them eternal life. So their works earned them eternal death. The wages of sin is death. See, whether we realize or not, it pays a wage. And that wage can only be covered by the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Anything else will fall short. No amount of catechisms, no amount of giving, no amount of Sunday school, none of it will take place, can take the place of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why, that's why Jesus said that there were two ways. One was very narrow, and he said, few there be that find it. And he said, the other one was broad. And he said, a lot of people are going to find that way because they think there's a lot of different ways into heaven. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches there is only one sacrifice that's acceptable to God, and that is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Does that make any sense, Ms. Barber? Help you any? No? Really confuse you? Okay, because I want to look at this other one right quick, too. There's a judgment of the saved. Okay, this is called the Bema Seat Judgment, B-E-A-M-A, -A, Bema Seat Judgment. If you go on the internet and you look that up, or if you go into a good lexicon, or you go into a book of history, this is, this is the judgment at the end of the games, like the Olympics. And it only determines who's first, second, and third. Not whether or not you were ever in the race. See, the first one, the first judgment, that judgment is of the dead. You know why they call it of the dead? Because they're going to be eternally separated. This judgment now has to say, okay, what have you done with the blessings that I have given you? What have you done with what I have blessed you with? Okay? Some people are going to build on wood, hay, and stubble. And what happens to it when it's tried by fire? What happens to wood? What happens to hay? You want to see a fire, man. You, you watch a bale of hay catch on fire. And brother, it'll take 20 fire trucks to put that dude out. You know what I'm saying? He says, those works won't hold up. The only thing that holds up under fire is stuff like precious metals, gold, silver, those kind of things. Okay? So let, let me read you this verse right quick. This is 2 Corinthians 5 and 9 through 11. He says, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to he hath done, whether it's good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are manifest in your conscience. What does he mean by that? 
Anybody? He says, we know the terror of God. What does that mean? Is God terrifying? That's it. To have to give account. It's absolutely right. It's the answer. It is the idea that, guess what? We, we're careful about the way we live because we know there is a judgment coming. That, you know, you're not just going to step into eternity fat, dumb, and happy and say, well, here I am now. I'm ready for my, my chicken suit. That's not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? God is saying, I am giving you precious assets. That young lady that sits beside you, that handsome young man that sits beside you, your children, your grandchildren, these are all assets on loan from God. These are all blessings. What have you done with them? Have you belittled them? Have you pulled them down? Have you destroyed them? Has your family been upside down because you're a knucklehead? Well, you're going to give an account for that. After you've been saved, you're going to give an account for everything that you've done. And that's why, you know, it's, it, I like the way Jesus put it. He said, we're going to give an account for every idle word. Now, have you ever thought about that for a minute? Yes, Miss Terry. One thing that I, I have a hard time understanding is you know, God says, when you have forgiveness, you, you know, you're forgiven. But then when No, I, I think what he's saying up here is, is that we give an account for our works. Mm-hmm. We give an account for the way we lived our life. Not whether or not we're going to be, because we're going to plead the blood, right, which is grace. All right, so then we turn around and we say, okay, we're pleading the blood. What works then is he talking about? Well, were you faithful in your service to the Lord? You know, after you got saved, did you, are you one of those people that showed up the time you got baptized and then we never saw you again? Or, you know, were you the person that was on, on the front row saying, hey, let me invite you to church. Let me tell you about Jesus. Those, kind, those are the works that he's talking about. What did you do with your family? Did you bother? Yeah, it's interesting to me that we, we, we talk about young families and things like that. And... Um, it's interesting to me that to a parent, that a ball game would be more important than their children's eternity. But yet, that's where we find ourselves, that the church is in competition with ball games and, and, and different activities, right? And the parents go in and say, well, yeah, I know he's probably going to miss something that he really needs, but he can't go on this mission trip because they're playing in the ball game. You understand what I'm saying? I think you're going to give an account for that because here's the deal. People say, well, I can't bring my kid to Sunday school, but yet you say, okay, so you want him to go to spear, you know, a basket weaving tech? Is that what you want him to get a job doing? No, man, I want him to go to Harvard. I want him to have the best schools. I want him to have all that. Well, you know, but you won't teach him about Jesus? Now, that says something, doesn't it? That says something about our priorities. Well, I, I, you know... He has to stay so late. I've told you all that story. You know, they have to stay so late on Wednesdays, and we can't, you know. Hey, you know, I understand. You know, your kids got to get an education. You go down to the Mexican place, now they're all standing there dirty and everything. Horse can't talk because they've been at the ball game hollering and screaming. But they couldn't come to church because it stayed too late. Do you understand what I'm saying? These are the things I think we will give an account for. You know what I'm saying? What do we build our lives on? You know, some people build their lives on getting ahead. I mean, I got to have this job. I got to have that job. I got to have the money. I got to have this. I got to have that. And then at the end of their lives, they're regretful because they said, you know, I was working all the time. I have time to spend with my family. Amen. Well, you know, I, I mean, I made a lot of money. Okay, so where's the, where's the bank truck behind the hearse? Well, you know, because the things only, you know, Jesus said, put your treasures up in heaven, right? Well, what do those treasures look like? Those treasures look like our works. But I do think this, I think it does point, you know, very poignantly, we need to be careful the way we live our lives. We need to be careful about what's important to us. Uh, You know what I'm saying? This, I don't think sin is in view here. I really don't, because again, like you just quoted, it does. When he forgives you, you're forgiven. You don't have to go back there and visit it. He's forgiven it. You know what I'm saying? 
However, the works we do, the way we live, the way we conduct our lives, the way we treat people we come in contact with, uh, are we faithful to church? Do we do anything uh, for the kingdom? Or do we always make excuses? And you've met those people. We have people who come to church here like that. Every excuse in the world works for them not being here. You know, unless we're eating or, or there's a singing or something like that. Then they can show up. But other than that, you don't ever see them, you know. I think they're giving account for that. You know what I'm saying? And I ain't relishing that idea because there's a bunch of stuff in my life I'm going to have to give an account for. You know what I'm saying? But all of us are going to appear. So when he says he convicted the world of judgment, he wasn't talking about just then. He's talking about now. We need to be prepared now. And, and the terror of the Lord is to know that we've got to give an account. That you can't just do whatever you want to. And, and that crowd, that once saved, always saved crowd, which is, you know, people say, you don't believe? I, I believe in eternal security. Most of the time when I hear somebody say, once saved, always saved, yeah, I'm saved. You know why? Because I'm at the lake when I should be at church. Because I'm, I'm doing something else, you know what I'm saying, when I should be at church. And that's what they're saying. Well, I, I slip, you know, and, and my mouth's like a gutter rat, but, uh, you know, once saved, always saved. Do you begin to see how flippant that becomes in the sacrifice that was made on your behalf? Well, I can just do what I want to because I'm once saved, always saved. You might want to check yourself on that. Because if the Holy Spirit's not convicting you of sin in your life, Folks, let me tell you something. You might want to check. Paul says over there, hey, you better make sure you're in the family of God and you're the only one that can do it. Preacher can't do it for you. You know, we, we've had a, a, too many funerals here lately. You know, and, and praise God, there were people that I knew uh, that went home to be with Jesus. But you'd be surprised if people think you can preach your loved ones into heaven. If they just pay enough, if they just have a nice enough funeral, if they did, ain't going to happen. We are the sum of the decisions we make in this life. And when you stand before God, you're going to give an account for the decisions that you've made in this life. Good, bad, or ugly. Does that make any sense? Okay. I really confuse you. You getting a lot of looks. Especially when I said something about the lake. It must be warming up. Huh? <laughs> All right. He says uh, in verse, uh, was that 13? Uh, where am I at? Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now, he says this. Uh, let me get over here where I can read this. He said, now, this is a reference to Satan. John chapter 12, verse 31 says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Hebrews 2 and 14. He says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. First John 3 and 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, we don't talk a lot here about Satan. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Because Peter says, don't give him place. And I, I, I'm not going to give him place either. I, if I want to talk about anybody, I want to talk about Jesus. Okay? But we need to understand that there is a prince of this world. We need to understand that when we tend to get mad with our brother, when we tend to get mad with, with the boss at work or whatever, we need to remember that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. But we're, fl we're wrestling against principalities and powers in high places. Now, you know, as the swamp gets drained a little bit, we begin to see some of that wickedness in high places. We begin to see, you know, as the veil is kind of ripped back a little bit, we, you know, people are doing things that we would have never thought that they were capable of doing. Well, that's because the warfare is spiritual. Mm -hmm. See, we want to vote out, hang out to dry, whatever you want to say, these particular people. But, but they're just a puppet. You know what I'm saying? He said that if you serve sin, you're of the devil, period. 
So if sin is reigning in your life, you might want to ask yourself, am I saved? Because even Jesus said over in Matthew, there's going to be a bunch of folks that said, didn't we come to Sunday school all the time? Weren't we baptized? Didn't we do all those wonderful things? Didn't we speak in tongues? And he's going to say, I didn't know you. Oh, wait a minute. We did all that in your name. I didn't know you. Is that what he said? So, yes, ma'am. Is that my boy? No. Okay, that's Hank. Yes, ma'am. So about Satan and the fact that he was judged and that those people that lived in sin, according to this verse right here, were of the devil. Okay. All right. Well, sure? Okay. Okay. All right. So these three verses show us the complete, perfect work of the Holy Spirit. Conviction of sin the need for righteousness, and ours isn't sufficient, and the understanding of judgment yet to come. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. It ain't about how many pews you can run on top of or how, sh- how loud you can shout and run around the building. That's not it. That's not his job. His job is to convict you of sin, right? And, and you know, we as Christians, uh, we... I think we do our best to avoid that conviction. I, I don't know. You don't have to raise your hand. Please don't. Cause, okay, Miss Barbara. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Let's back up one. When you find verses like this one, if you'll go back and look at it in the original language, the tenth of the adverb in front of sin usually will tell you what it's discussing. When he says committeth, you can go into Thayer's and look that up, and I will guarantee you it'll be in the first person singular, which means, guess what? It is a continuous, an eros tense. It is going on constantly. It is a way of life. And here's the deal. You know, you're talking about those kind of people that that's a way of life to. Their sin is, you'll never know it. Because they're good enough at hiding it. That they think that the preacher don't know, that Barbara don't know. And we may not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but, but are you living in it? Are you, are you just saying, hey, that's it, that's done, this is the way of life for me? See, so you're not doing that. Because the Holy Spirit does what? He's just like a bird dog. Just like a coon dog, isn't he? He'll get you up a tree and start banging out, ooh. And he don't, and you know what? You don't sleep at night. You roll around, toss and turn, look at the ceiling, you know, because you're thinking about, because the Holy Spirit is saying, this is not for you. This is not your lifestyle. Uh, it'd be very much, you've heard the hog trough analogy. The pig can't go back to the slop. It just says, nope, this ain't the way I want to live. That only comes from a changed nature. See? And, and I don't think that's the case with the people he's talking about here. Their nature has that. They put on a mask. You know what I'm saying? And they're very good at it. The people that do this, you'll never know this side of heaven. You'll never, you'll never even have an inkling of what's going on. So that's why, you know, that's why he says, guard yourself. Okay, that make any sense? Okay, let's jump back over here right quick. All right, so here is the perfect work of the Holy Spirit. When you tell people, you know, that, that I'm this and I'm that and the Holy Spirit manifested this, let me tell you something. 
You need to understand that the Holy Spirit is dealing in eternal matters. Not the frivolous junk that we hear today. Oh, there's gold falling from the ceiling. Come on. Get real. You know, you're not living in a comic book. You should be able to open up the words of life and see them. You know, and I'll tell you something else about this, this conviction of sin. If you can sit here and hear the word of God and live in sin and it not convict you, you got a problem. You got a way bigger problem than whether you're coming to church or not. Because here's the deal, right? The Bible says that those that are without chastening, correction, guess what? They're illegitimate. It uses another word, King James does, but I'll just tell you, you're illegitimate. That means you're not real. You're not, uh, to borrow the words that one guy, you're not bona fide. All right? So he convicts of sin. You ever white knuckle the pew? And don't raise your hand. All right? Ever white knuckle the pew? Waiting on that amen to guys so you could just go charging out of here. Hope nobody speaks to you because the Holy Spirit's got you up a tree. Because, you know what I'm saying? You can, I mean, here's the deal. We, you know how I told you we always rationalize our sin? And we always do. I don't care who you are. You're going to write, well, you know, he ain't such a bad boy. He's only killed 15 people. You know what I'm saying? But he, you know, he's a good boy. Well, yeah, might want to define good for me. But the idea is, is that we, we say, well, you know, uh, I only do this or that or the other. And I, I hesitate. Let's get, I only eat at buffets and just because I like to eat. might want to think about that because the Holy Spirit might be saying to you, you know, you're killing yourself with a knife and fork. Amen? Might be that you're making excuses for why you're out there going, <sighs> right? Well, you know, I just, can't, I this, I can't. See? And the Holy Spirit's doing what? You just lay with it long enough. He'll tell you. You'll get to the point where you despise it. And can't lay it down. You know why? Because who you serve, that's who your master is. So the idea is, is that guess what? We need to welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, I'm out of line with where I need to be and I want to be in line. Okay? And then when it comes to the, the, the idea of convincing us of righteousness, to realize that it's only Jesus' righteousness that God will accept. Will not accept yours. Won't accept mine. Won't accept anybody's. But the only begotten Son of God. And then you need to understand. I think even the Christians need to understand. Judgment's coming. You know what I'm saying? It's coming for everybody. Lost and saved. And I think that should temper the way we live our lives. And, and I, let me use this example. Okay? Might bring it home, okay? If you're whipping down Gordon Highway at 150 miles an hour like everybody else coming off of Fort Gordon, okay? And you get in this curve down here over by Lewis's house, and there's a blue car sitting over there with his lights on, what immediately happens? Well, <laughs> whip! Try not to kill all the people in front of you by slamming your brakes on. Is that not right? So tomorrow... When you're coming from the house, speeding because you're 30 minutes late for work, right, what goes through your mind? There may be a state patrol sitting there. And what do you do? It tempers your decision, doesn't it, to know that those blue lights might be in your rearview mirror. Now, as long as we don't think they're there, what do we do? Ooh, right? Well, here's the deal. You can drive it like you're stolen, it's stolen if you want to, uh, but eventually it'll catch up with you, amen? And that's the same way that God is saying, that's what Paul is saying here, that you need to be aware there is a judgment coming. And so if you can just go out there and do whatever you want to, live whichever way you want to, you might want to really consider where you are because maybe you're not where you need to be with the Lord, amen? And I'll leave it at that. Because it isn't my judgment to make. It's his judgment. If you don't believe in judgment, let me tell you something. You don't believe in justice. Because without judgment, there is no justice.
Somebody got verse 12 in this chapter right quick they could read for me? We're going to try and cover these two verses. I got a whole two minutes. Okay. What's he saying? What did he tell him in plain English? Nobody? Okay. Not ready for all the answers. What? Y'all remember that movie, Officer and Gentleman? And that guy keeps on with that colonel or something, and he tells him, you can't handle the truth? That's kind of what he's talking about. Now, when you think about that, before you get ready to say, them dumb Jews, I don't disciples are crazy. Think about this for just a minute now. What if you were raised all of your life to the age of 30 as a Jew? And now... Somebody's fixing to tell you what? Keep the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Don't do no work on the Sabbath day. Sundown to sunrise. Right? Now what's fixing to happen? What's fixing to happen as soon as he raises from the dead? What day do we worship? We do not worship on the Sabbath. I hope you all know that. We worship on Sunday. Why do we worship on Sunday? (laughs) Because that celebrates the resurrection, and that's why we don't worship on the Sabbath. All right? An Orthodox Jew will continue to keep the Sabbath. The reason, that's because they don't accept Christianity. And see, that's what he's telling them. He said, I got a lot of things that are going to change in your life, and you can't handle them. He says, if I tell you now, you'll go crazy. Right? Now, think about that. Now, for just a second, Kokai, because now these little Jewish boys are now fixing to change from the Jewish Sabbath to the Christian Sunday, right? And what's going to happen when they do that? All their friends are going to go, what's wrong? Yeah, yeah. The whole nation has been what? Think about it for a minute. The Jewish nation has been what? By their own decision, they have rejected him. Is that not right? Now God, now Jesus is telling them, look, all these centuries, you've been the chosen people, right? Now what's fixing to happen? How about that? Is that better? The age of the Gentiles is coming. Imagine what that must have been like. Imagine turning their world upside down. And that's what Jesus has yet to tell them. And he says, I can't tell you right now because, one, you won't believe it. Two, you won't accept it. It's going to take what? It's going to take them going to an empty tomb. And talking to an angel before it's going to click in their heads exactly what what God's plan of salvation is. Because, I mean, when you really stop and think about it for a minute now, we've been in the Western culture all our life. You think about it for a minute. It's pretty fantastic when you stop and think about it for a minute that God, the creator of everything that we know, came from heaven, put on a body, was crucified, maligned all his life, crucified, and then rose again the third day. Isn't that fantastic? That's fantastic when you stop and think about it. Why would God, what are we? He just creates some more, right? Remember that old saying your daddy told you when you were little? He said, you kept messing up, said, uh, said, I brought you in this world, I'll take you out, and I'll create another one that looks just like you. 
So the idea is, is that guess what? It is, it is, it is beyond human comprehension to understand what God is doing through the plan of salvation. And these guys, you got to remember, now, you know, they're pretty tore up because he's telling them what? I'm fixing to leave. And I got these people all fired up, and I'm fixing to walk away. And I can guarantee you that's exactly the way they viewed it. Here we go. Now, we done followed him. We done quit everything. We done sold all the boats. We, we ain't got nothing to fall back. No plan B. And now he's leaving. Imagine where they were at. Though they needed the Holy Spirit way worse than they ever understood that they needed the Holy Spirit. Okay? We're going to stop right here. Okay? Any questions? Really confused you. All right. Uh, and if not, then, uh, we, please be careful. Going, yes, brother.